My name is Norman Wurzba, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this series entitled Facing the Anthropocene. In case you're unfamiliar with the term, the Anthropocene marks the unprecedented moment when human beings, or at least some of them, became a dominant force in planetary history, responsible for the widespread alteration of the world's land, ocean, atmospheric, and life systems. Though planetary systems and biological processes are still clearly at work, their expressions and their effects can no longer be understood apart from human activity. Ranging from the cellular to the biological level, there is no place on earth that does not reflect humanity's technological prowess and its economic reach. The advent of the Anthropocene, in other words, compels a rethinking of multiple fundamental questions, like the following. What sort of being is the human being that now exerts this outsized power? To what end should this power be directed? And how will we be, be able to determine when this power becomes irresponsible? Is anything sacred? What sort of world should people endeavor to build together? And what would be the economic, legal, and political mechanisms we will need to get there. How should we think about hope? It is unlikely that the frames of thought that brought us to this moment are sufficient to help us imagine and implement a better future, which is why we now need to commit to rigorous probing of the assumptions and the commitments that have brought us to where we now are. And we invite you to join in this conversation so as we get to the, the concluding part of our webinar, we invite you to put questions in the Q&A that are at the bottom of your Zoom screen so that we can take those up with about 15 minutes to go. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our guest for today's webinar. Douglas Kaiser is the Joseph M. Field Class of 55 Professor of Law at the Yale Law School, where he also directs with another colleague the Law, Ethics, and Animal Program. He was born and raised in Indiana, and under the guidance of his mother, came, for a great, came to have a great love of the outdoors and also a love for reading. He went to the University of Indiana, where he also studied with Scott Russell Sanders, the great writer of nature. He went to law school at Harvard and began teaching at Cornell before moving to Yale in 2008. Douglas's work studies the way that law and regulations can work in the context that bring environmental harm to us as a society. His particular focus is climate change law and policy and is the author of Regulating From Nowhere, Environmental Law and the Search for Objectivity. Please join me in welcoming Doug to this webinar. Well, thank you so much, Norman, um, not only for that introduction, but thank you for organizing, conceiving, implementing the collaborative project on the Anthropocene that has culminated in this webinar series. Um, I really also want to thank my fellow project participants uh, who are a brilliant, lively, and diverse group. It's been an honor and a pleasure to engage with them, and my summer this year will feel much poorer without a trip to Duke to learn from this community, Norman, that you've convened. In the session today, I will first lay out some basic facts about climate change, including some facts that you already know, some that you don't know, and some that are resistant to being known. That is, some that resist being grasped and appreciated no matter how many times we hear them. After that introduction, I'll raise some questions for the future of higher education that follow from the brutal facts of climate change. And I should warn you that brutal is no overstatement. What we have wrought on a planetary scale is almost unthinkable. And yet we must think it. We must think it especially at a university where we have the luxury of space, time, and encouragement to gaze far into the future. And I'll conclude with uh, a short story about a newt. So scientists have understood for a long time that the addition of carbon dioxide, which is the principal greenhouse gas emitted through human activities, could result in a warming of the Earth's atmosphere. One of the earliest experimental demonstrations of this fact was reported in 1856 
in the American Journal of Science and Arts. The experiment was conducted by Eunice Newton Foote, a scientist, inventor, and women's rights advocate from Seneca Falls, New York. Her findings were read before the American Association for the Advancement of Science at that organization's annual meeting. They were later published under the title Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays. It is noteworthy that her paper was read at that meeting by a male scientist from the Smithsonian Institution. Historians speculate that Eunice herself may have not been permitted to deliver the paper. Nonetheless, through her study of sunlight's effect on different compositions of gases sealed in vacuum tubes, Eunice Foote unequivocally demonstrated that increases of carbon dioxide in the air would increase the Earth's temperature. Now, it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that scientists began to monitor atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, most notably through a research station atop a mountain in Hawaii that was established by the great climate scientist Charles Keeling. That data series, along with others that would follow, shows an inexorable rise in carbon dioxide concentrations, interrupted only by slight ticks up and down that accompany the seasonal cycles of plant growth and decay. Over time, scientists also have linked the increase in atmospheric CO2 to human activities, primarily the combustion of fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution, but also large-scale land use changes such as deforestation. Scientists have worked mightily to disentangle the human-caused or anthropogenic influences on radiative forcing from other influences, such as solar cycles, volcanic activity, cloud cover, and so on. At this point, it's not disputed that the human contribution to radiative forcing is substantial and increasing. It is also not disputed that, as the 1856 experiment predicted, the climate has been warming and that the bulk of that warming, especially since the so-called Great Acceleration following World War II, is attributable to human activities. Here is a more intuitive way to visualize the temperature increases the Earth has experienced over the last century and a half. The animation is gonna pause when we reach the present date, and then it will commence with projections for the remainder of the current century. Now, everything I've just said, with the possible exception of the unheralded role of Eunice Foote, is probably well known to anyone who joins a webinar series on the Anthropocene. What I wanna say next may not be as well known, but I believe it's absolutely critical to a full understanding of the climate change problem. If I were given a chance to present just one slide on climate change to the entire world, I would choose this one. Unlike most discussions of climate science and policy, this slide places our current predicament in the context of the long, long history of the planet. Paleoclimate scientists use ice core samples and other methods to reconstruct the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations and the average temperature on the planet stretching back over 400 million years. And what they've learned is that we are currently at a level of atmospheric CO2 that has not been seen on the planet for 3 million years, a time before humans even existed as a distinct species. At that time, three million years ago, sea levels were around 50 feet higher than they are today. On our current trajectory by the year 2050, we may hit a level of CO2 not seen on the planet for approximately 50 million years, back to a time when palm trees grew in Alaska and crocodiles swam in the Arctic. If we continue on for another century or two at our current rate, we will have to look back some 200 to 400 million years to find an analogous period in our planetary history. 250 million years ago was a time period known as the end Permian mass extinction, a time when geologically dramatic and rapid increases in greenhouse gas emissions triggered changes that killed off more than 96% of marine life and 70% of terrestrial life on the earth. Now these are grim facts and I'm about to make them worse. If I were given the chance to present a second slide on climate to the world, I would choose this one. 
few people outside the climate science and policy world appreciate that most of the official projections that you hear about, despite being depressing in their own right, are actually quite conservative in their orientation. The official scientific processes, such as those used by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, are deliberately structured to endorse only the most well-characterized, supported, and replicated scientific findings. Scientists have long urged the world to appreciate that within the Earth system exist tipping elements that must be reckoned with, even though they're difficult to predict and model in the neat, tidy fashion sought by policymakers. Indeed, over the last year, increasing evidence shows that some of these tipping mechanisms may now be active, and in fact, may be irreversibly so. So for example, the boundary between the Arctic and North Atlantic oceans is becoming blurred by warming ocean water and by freshwater inundation from ice sheet melt. Eventually, the Great Atlantic Conveyor Belt may shut down, bringing a change in ocean currents with massive implications for marine life and weather patterns the world over. Two tipping elements that deserve special mention because they threaten release of greenhouse gases that will themselves further enhance climate change. One, the Amazon rainforest, which contains literally billions of tons of carbon sequestered in trees and other plant life. To understand the Amazon, you need to understand that a single drop of water evaporates and precipitates numerous times as it travels the course of the Amazon River, bathing the ecosystem with moisture. It's said that trees in the Amazon make their own rain. But with enough increase in temperature or enough deforestation due to fires and logging, this vast system can rapidly tip from a wet rainforest to a dry savanna releasing in the process those billions of tons of carbon, which in turn will exacerbate climate change much further. Likewise, we've begun to see worrying signs that the Arctic is moving into a new state characterized by unprecedented heat and wildfires. Last summer, a town in Siberia hit 38 degrees Celsius, the warmest temperature ever recorded above the Arctic Circle. With this new Arctic normal comes the risk that vast amounts of carbon dioxide, as well as potentially methane stored in Arctic permafrost or submerged within frozen hydrates in lakes and seas may be released into the atmosphere. Now, from the lawyer's perspective, what makes these tipping elements so worrisome is that they represent sources of greenhouse gas emissions that cannot be regulated. Even if we made, waved a magic wand and adopted an aggressive global climate change policy tomorrow, we still may have no way of stopping release of methane from Siberia or carbon from the Amazon. Finally, scientists increasingly speculate that a tipping point may already have been reached with respect to the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets, such that we are committed irreversibly to meters of sea level rise and to an eventual return of the coastlines of 3 million years ago. Even East Antarctica is beginning to show signs of glacial collapse, which means that vast ice sheets anchored on land may also become destabilized, findings which have led scientists to revise dramatically upward their projections for potential sea level rise during the coming decades and beyond. Indeed, some scientists have become so alarmed by these findings that they've proposed seemingly fantastical engineering projects such as building a 100 meter high underwater berm around Antarctica that would separate a cold coastal body of water from the warming oceans, hopefully delaying the inevitable melting of the frozen continent. The idea seems laughable, outlandish to us, but the scientists proposing it are not laughing. They're driven by a sense of moral desperation. In the face of nihilism, they're using their knowledge and expertise in creative, audacious ways to meet the scale of the challenge before us. A question I wanna raise for this session is what actions and proposals would follow if the rest of us behaved similarly? If we sought in the face of potential nihilism to use our knowledge and expertise in creative audacious ways to meet the scale of the climate challenge before us. Because tipping point scenarios are uncertain and nonlinear and just generally hard to get our heads wrapped around, they're typically not included within the official climate projections that are distributed for policymakers and for public consumption. The upshot, though, is clear. It is later than we think 
because of the extraordinary inertia and nonlinearity of the climate system, we are entering uncharted territory, no matter what choices we make from now. We are sledding on melting ice, and for the foreseeable future, we must live knowing the ice may break beneath us. Now, I believe the picture I just sketched has profound implications for the mission of the university. Obviously, one aspect of our mission going forward is to help officials and decision makers identify and implement appropriate climate change policies, laws, and regulations. But to be honest, and I say that as a lawyer, this is the easy part. We know what technologies and policy tools are needed to speed the transition to a net zero emissions economy. We know them. What we don't know is how to get them adopted within the world and the government and the cultures and the ideologies that we've inherited. To remain relevant in the climate century, higher education will need to adapt. Our legal system and our system of higher ed has largely been premised on an assumption that humanity's narrative is one of overall progress that the arc of history is indeed bending toward justice, that innovation and economic growth will continue apace, that respect for rights and the rule of law will continue to take root and foster peace and security in the world. I hope all of those assumptions prove true, but we would be wise in light of the climate crisis to explore alternatives that assume otherwise. We would be wise to ask what role education and law may play to contain suffering in an age of collapse. That's the negative aspect of adapting higher education. The positive aspect would be this, and I'm gonna put it quite grandly. We've long considered the law to be an enabler and defender of enlightenment values and with good reason, but our mission going forward may be also to include an additional charge. How can we surpass those enlightenment values that enabled in less than three centuries, a mode and scale of human existence that now threatens the survivability of all life on earth? individualism, liberalism, secularism, materialism, capitalism, this spasm of isms that erupted in just the blink of an evolutionary eye and that is seemingly and unwittingly provided the operating code for the planet's sixth great extinction. How can we salvage what is worthy and good in those enlightenment isms while abandoning the hubris, the imperialism, the human exceptionalism, the tendency to dominate and destroy in the name of progress, the tendency that has brought us so far out onto the ice. It's easier, of course, to frame those kinds of questions than to answer them. And so rather than venture an answer now, I'll instead conclude by gesturing through a story, a story about a newt. Three years ago, I had the good fortune to be hiking with my daughter in Vermont when we stumbled upon a small pond that was teeming with juvenile red spotted newts. I grew up in a rural wooded area in Southern Indiana and spent most of my free time as a child outdoors. My engagement with the more than human world was routine and there seemed to be so much more of the more than human world. Animals were everywhere during my childhood. Now, when I stumble upon a pond filled with newly born amphibians, it feels like an event an event worth sharing on a webinar. My daughter, who I'll call Sunny in these remarks, had never seen newts in her lifetime. So we devoted that afternoon to communing with them. I carefully scooped one of the young newts up in my cupped hands and let Sunny hold it. She was four years old at the time. She's not a calm child. She's more of the hyperkinetic, hypertalkative sort. But with this filmy alien in her hand, she was transformed. She became utterly entranced, perfectly still, unreservedly present. After a few minutes in the thrall of this tiny creature, Sunny whispered to me, I bet she thinks I'm a giant. And then after a pause, Sunny added, I hope she knows I'm a gentle giant. Now, what I loved about that moment is that it showed my daughter's grasp of some important truths that are undeniable about the human animal relation. Scientists, philosophers, and lawyers, we tend to define truth as that which cannot be doubted, but there are other ways of knowing, including knowing that which cannot be denied. One thing Sonny appeared to accept as an undeniable truth in that moment was that the non-human animal in her hand was a subject with a perspective on the world that deserves consideration. Sonny called the newt she, 
not in an anthropomorphizing way, but simply because Sonny hadn't yet learned to depersonify her fellow creature as it. She speculated on what the newt was thinking, not in an effort to elevate its standing in a ladder of life, but simply because she hadn't yet learned to confine the label thinking to the eccentricities of human consciousness. At the time, Sonny also seemed to sense the unbridgeable gap between her and this other, other mind. Sonny said, I hope she knows, recognizing that any mutual understanding between her and the newt must race, rest on faith and belief as much as reason and evidence. Importantly, though, Sonny did not shy away from this yawning chasm. Quite the contrary, she seemed to relish the opportunity to commune with animate mystery. And it was a communion. Despite knowing she could not know what the newt knows, Sonny still described herself as being in relation with this other. And the relationship had two notable features. First, Sonny saw that she is, in her word, the giant. Even at four years old, she seemed to sense her awful power as a member of the species Homo sapiens. But Sonny also imbued the re relation with ethical dimensions that exceed power. She constituted herself in relation to the newt as a gentle giant. Now, I'm a fact witness to these offense, and I can attest that Sonny was indeed incredibly gentle with the one ounce wonder of life coiled in her hand. In that little moment, she seemed to demonstrate Emmanuel Levinas's truth that we do not arrive in the world as subjects first. We are instead called into being by others to whom we are infinitely ethically obliged. We are individuated through our relations to others and in particular to those others who are absolutely vulnerable to our existence. In Levinas's philosophy, do not kill me is the wordless utterance issued by an inscrutable other that first calls us into being. I hope I don't sound grandiose if I tell you that I believe Sonny likewise heard that newt compel her, do not kill me. Now in telling the story of Sonny and the newt, I hope to center questions regarding our ethical responsibility to non-human life. In humanity's relationship with animals and nature, humans hold all the power, perhaps now more so than ever, with this power amplified exponentially through industrial formations, such as the animal agriculture industry and technologies such as germline genetic engineering. How we use our power over animals is a vital test of our moral character and our role as stewards of life. In telling the story of Sonny and the Newt, I also hope to set up a contrast between the ethical imagination that I saw in her engagement with that other life form and the dearth of imagination that we too often find in much of our present response to the Anthropocene. Even the very term Anthropocene reflects something of a lack of imagination. As the climate justice scholar Maxine Burkett notes, the term seems to suggest that our current predicament arose as an inevitable consequence of something fundamental about and common to all of humanity. But that narrative is false. Climate change and many of the other ecological ills plaguing us today arose from a very distinctive form of human, one that spread from Europe and with its spasm of isms brought about a relation to the earth qualitatively different from anything precedent in our existence. We are in the midst of the sixth great extinction event in the planet's history, and we are well on our way to fashioning a climate that is incompatible with stable social existence. It would seem, as Norman mentioned in the introduction, it would seem unlikely if the worldviews and institutions that gave rise to this crisis will also be the ones that solve it. Yet we also seem incapable of escaping those worldviews and institutions, of stepping outside of our largely neoliberal imagination, even when our survival seems to depend on it. This inability to imagine an alternative to the end of the world is telling and terrifying. The newt is there, cupped in our hands. Will we giants be gentle? All right, thank you so much, Doug, for that presentation. There's a great deal for us to, to talk about regarding it. So before we do our conversation, I'd like to again invite webinar participants, uh, if you'd like to pose a question to Doug, please put that in the Q&A in the Zoom function and we will get to it towards the end of our, of our seminar today. So Doug, there's so much here. Um, 
I want us to start by thinking about how we seem to have been living for a very long time with an assumption, which is that nature is more or less ordered, more or less predictable, and that we can make our planning, our decisions, our policies, what have you, with an assurance that the world will look pretty much like it looks now down the road. Now, what you're your graphs and your presentation reveal is that we're moving into a highly unpredictable uh, future where we already see tipping points that are becoming active that, uh, for instance, if we do see something like coastal currents or ocean currents changing, or if we see the release of methane, ga methane gas because of permafrost melt, we, we really have no idea what the world will be looking like. And we've already seen how just some smaller modifications in climate, say the case of Syria and the refugee crisis that has followed in its wake, we're talking about pretty radical instability. So my question is, how do we think, how do we try to plan in a context of such uncertainty? Because we've not had practice at this before, right? Is, is the starting point to get rid of the assumption of predictability or do we have to do something different? Um. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's, you know, it feels as if we've always thought about nature that way as something that reveals its secrets using our capacity of reason and experimentation and evidence analysis and so on. Um, and that therefore we will be able to map and understand and predict the natural world in a way that will enable our um, dependence on it, but also mastery of it. It feels as if we've always had that worldview, but I don't think we've always had that worldview. I think that's actually a, a fairly recent, you know, in, in terms of like the long arc of human history, a fairly recent way of thinking about things. Um, and it's funny, I, I can look out my office window and I can see um, a, a, a place called East Rock Park here in New Haven, which is a place where um, at the end of the last ice age, the, the glaciers kind of came to a stop and there would have been almost a mile thick sheet of ice about about half a mile from my house and you know it's also the the rock formation there was part of those geologic eruptions of unthinkable amounts of magma that led to the hothouse earth i was describing 60 million years ago um and so like the the, the evidence is all around us that in fact we've been living in a very narrow an exceptional sweet spot, a comfort zone of, of kind of planetary quietude. Um, and that, and we could have kept it going for a while, but we screwed it up. We decided to start burning this stuff that we found in the ground. Um, so I think, you know, we, we're gonna have to unlearn some of these um, falsely reassuring truths that we have gotten so accustomed to. Um, and that's going to have dramatic implications for a lot of different areas of, of kind of human um, uh, expertise. Uh, so if you think about uh, the way in which um, economic thinking has encouraged us to take the system, map it, understand it, and then allocate all the parts of the system such that we maximize the overall efficiency, like that we get the biggest bang for our buck from allocating these resources. Like that's a very um, risk-seeking uh, risk way to manage affairs, right? You're not building in buffer zones and you're assuming kind of the brilliance of the, of the planner and you're assuming the replaceability of all the components and you're not, you're not adding in um, redundancy and diversity and all these other kinds of attributes beyond efficiency or optimality that one would have if one instead brought the worldview that nature goes through tumultuous and often unpleasant surprises. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about unpleasant surprises, we know that there's gonna be a lot of pain and a lot of suffering ahead for, for many, many people. Some will be able to insulate themselves somewhat from that pain and suffering. What do you see in, in the legal space where we've got folks thinking about what kinds of legal regimes we're gonna to need to have in place? No one, I don't think, is thinking that we're gonna fix climate change. So in a world of unpredictability, a world of increasing pain and 
turbulence and disruption and displacement. Do you see on the horizon legal frameworks, legal solutions, or legal responses to the kind of world we're heading toward? Uh, I wish I could offer a more optimistic response. Um, I, I mean, the, the starting point for me, because I'm trained in Anglo-American legal systems, uh, the starting for, point for me is that the, the legal system is really inherently conservative, right? It's designed to preserve the status quo, um, by which I mean the status quo of power relations. And, you know, it allows for some degree of adaptation and change, but, um, but the, the law is almost designed to kind of be the foot on the brake to make sure that the adaptation and the change doesn't happen too quickly. Of course, if we don't have any sort of responsiveness to change social circumstances or other forms of circumstances, then the law will, will fail for a different reason. Um, but I find, particularly in Anglo-American legal institutions, that it's inherently designed to resist reform and change. Um, and it's also deeply rooted in classical liberal political philosophy. So it's deeply rooted in a kind of individualistic um, um, and, and somewhat inegalitarian um, uh, kind of ethos, right? Uh, the, the, the kind of egalitarianism that it adopts is equality of nominal opportunity, not equality of outcomes. So it, um, and in that sense, when, what you're talking about, what do we do about um, this kind of predictable rise in massive amounts of suffering? Well, we would wanna think seriously about social safety nets and about, about risk spreading and about you know, universal healthcare and these sorts of things. Um, and one would think that you know, we've got, a lot of people are talking about the pandemic and how it is raising these kind of deep, deep questions about systemic injustice that are also gonna be raised by the impacts of climate change going forward. Um, and you would think that the kind of conversation you and I are probing towards here would have kind of risen with more salience, at least in the United States, and I haven't seen it. So, okay, so this is tough now because you, know, you began your presentation talking about how there are so many things that we know on a factual level. Right, we've known for quite a while about how greenhouse gas emissions work to, to warm the planet overall. And you, you, you talk about these facts not registering, things that we don't want to see, don't want to know. So I was gonna suggest that, well, look, if we don't have time, right, we're in a climate emergency, as we sometimes say, we don't have time for people to get it. We don't have time for people to change their minds or change their hearts. Maybe that's the better way to put it. The idea would be then, well, we'll have some enlightened leaders who will pass the legislation to protect people, which means something like an either overriding or suspension of democratic right, participation because people just aren't ready to, to see the importance of new policy, new legislation to address the kinds of things that we're up against. And you're telling me that the, the law doesn't really work in that way. It's not going to be a leader for us. So how do we talk about What's going to lead? Who's going to lead? Institutions, are they going to lead? Universities, are they going to lead? How are you thinking about this? Because we are in a kind of emergency. Bill McKibben says we've got less than 10 years to really put the brake completely on fossil fuel emissions. Um, how do you think about that? So I, I think that um, I want to push back a little bit on the notion that um, we can't depend on ordinary people to kind of get their heads wrapped around the crisis and uh, support appropriate responses to it. Um, I do think there is the, the kind of just the sheer existential magnitude of climate. Is, it's just hard to maintain a kind of cognitive grip on it because it, it, it just gives rise to so much internal dissonance, right? Like it, it, it leads to a debilitating sense of despair. Right. Um, and so what do we do? I mean, it, it's human nature when cognitive dissonance arises to try to alleviate that dissonance because it's incredibly discomforting. Um, and there's different ways of alleviating it, right? So one way is to kind of, you know, try to spring into action and address the source, 
right? The fear, the injustice, the whatever it is that's haunting, the wolf at the door, right? And the other way is to try to like wish it away, right? To deny the evidence or come up with an alternative narrative framing of what it is and therefore it's not um, as dissonant anymore. And I think we see this in the climate space a lot. It's not that people don't understand or haven't noticed or aren't paying attention. I think a lot of people are made incredibly comfortable by the idea that our way of life is causing, knowingly causing suffering now and will cause great suffering in the future. Because none of us want to believe we're embedded in systems of evil. I don't think that's in our nature to want to believe that. And so when we're given evidence that the simplest acts of daily life, like driving our car or turning on our light or eating meat, the simplest acts of daily life are contributing to a phenomenon that will inflict massive suffering that creates dissonance and we wanna to try to resolve it. Now, one way is to wish it away, to deny it. A different way um, would be to offer people a vision of a world in which they continue to have daily life activities, but not such that they cause massive suffering. And you know, I'm not here to stump for the Green New Deal, but I think part of the reason why that concept has had such traction and really fundamentally changed the way the politics of climate are operating and discussed is because it offers people a vision of a future in which they both continue to live as individuals, but also are not embedded in a system that's going to cause massive suffering. Yeah, that's helpful. I think I want to keep down this, this track of thought here with the question of education and how we need to rethink what it is universities do. And I want to join this with what you describe beautifully with the story of your daughter and the newt, because it seems to me that something so very powerful was happening there. And you use the word imagination, which I think is really, really important because it seems to me that we're at a point now where it's not about knowledge or more data collection that we need to be doing. We're really talking about how people desire, how people love, what they love. And, and your daughter had this encounter with a newt which was transformative. It, it opened up a way of seeing, it opened up a way of feeling, which I think is also so important to register. And I, and I guess I'm wondering, how are you thinking about the role of education in helping people move into this new kind of imaginary, one that your daughter had a glimpse of and that you described for us? Does it mean that we just need to do what you did with your daughter and take people to, to ponds in Vermont? Get, get, that, that the proper schooling is to get people out of school? Or, or how do you think about education? Because I think this is hugely important. Well, you know, I mean, I, so anything I say on this subject is just coming from the vantage point of being a lawyer in a law school, you know, who's qualified to teach law. I'm not, I'm not someone who has studied, you know, the theory of education, but I, I mean, I certainly think that we are suffering from nature deficit disorder. M almost all of us uh, in the contemporary world are, are, are that way. Um, and that as a result, those encounters with otherness and with other forms of life and with the kind of the, the, the extraordinary curriculum that nature offers just by walking in a wood. Um, like that, I think that's a real loss. Um, I, that doesn't mean we all have to kind of de-urbanize because that's not gonna happen. Um, right. But it does mean we could think more thoughtfully about how we design our urban spaces to offer surrogate opportunities, right? You can bring a lot of that curriculum from nature into city centers. Um, and I think we should be much more deliberate about that and much more deliberate about making sure that, you know, K to 12 education, it, it really fundamentally incorporates that. Incorporates that. Um, and in higher ed, like it won't surprise you and you'll probably be pleased to hear me say, we need to be like shoring up the humanities and making sure that this extraordinary tradition of creativity and, and introspection and thoughtfulness um, that the humanities offer above and beyond the kind of the, um, the insights, but also invitation to mastery that the STEM disciplines seem to offer. 
Um, I, I just think that's absolutely fundamental. Um, and of course, you know, there's a reason, and maybe it's going to be impolite for me to name this, but I will. Um, there's a reason that we have so much emphasis in higher ed right now on the STEM disciplines because they are so consonant with the demands of capitalism and higher ed is embedded in capitalism and responsive to those demands. Um, and so, you know, to talk about how we, you know, how we preserve and uh, enhance what education can do is really to open up a bigger conversation about the role of capitalism in, in our lives. Yeah, no, that, that's so, so helpful. And I think your invocation of Levinas here and, and an ethical imagination here is, I think, important because the sort of ethical theory that comes out of capitalism is utilitarianism, which is a kind of maximization of however you define pleasure. And of course, what you've got in that is not really an ethical system at all, right? You have a, a kind of ledger system where you, you know, evaluate credits and balances and so forth. The ethical imagination you're talking about is something vastly different because it seems to presume something like what we would call the sanctity of life. And it doesn't seem to me that in, in the world of, of sort of calculation, that there's a whole lot of room for sanctity. And, you know, Sonny's encounter with the newt seemed to be a moment of that sort of ethical encounter with the sacred. Do you think that the law has any way to speak about this or approach this whole way of, of speaking? I do, I, I do. Um, and this is gonna mark me as a little bit of a 1970s um, tree hugger type, but I, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so the statutes that the US adopted in the 1970s, the foundational environmental laws that we adopted, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and so on, those statutes deliberately, knowingly eschewed cost-benefit optimization, like utilitarian consequentialist ethics as their foundation. They did not want to sort of only save species to the point where the benefits of doing so just equaled the cost of doing so. Um, and it wasn't because they had never heard of economics. It was because the legislators um, rejected that ethical framework for how we think about nature. Um, and many of the statutes set up seemingly unachievable, seemingly kind of aspirational and naive goals, like we will eliminate water pollution such that all rivers and lakes will be swimmable and drinkable and so on. Mm -hmm. um, or we will have a workplace in which every worker has a safe injury-free workplace. We would set these standards that the economists would sort of say, that's naive. Of course, like there's always going to be death and suffering. There's always trade-offs. There's always injury. And no one buys a car with 800 airbags because even they don't value their own lives so much that they're going to spend everything they own for 800 airbags. Those things are true. Like both, of, there, there's a truth in both of these frameworks that the economists are right. There are always trade-offs. We live in a world of scarce resources we will always have to make those hard decisions. But the 1970s environmental legislators were also right that if we reduce to that way of thinking about the world, we lose something important about our ethics and about our ability to, to, to relate to the sacred. And what we lose is, is the moral remainder. We lose the idea that those deaths are regret, you know, regrettable, that even though it turned out, yes, this was the right amount to spend on pollution reduction, and some kids still have asthma in the inner city, that's a horrible human failing, right? That's a tragedy. That's not a cost, that's a tragedy. And the tragedy serves as this kind of like, this, you know, this splinter in our brain telling us, you gotta try harder, you've gotta do better. You've gotta change these figures so that the tragic trade-offs are not so starkly posed. Yeah. You know, Charles Taylor has this wonderful line in one of his earlier books where he says the drive to objectivity that we see in modern political economic thought goes side by side with the lessening of the moral claim that others can have upon us. And, and your, your discussion seems to be drawing us to how do we help us each other right, understand something about the moral claim of the world upon us 
because without that, it doesn't seem that we're going to be able to, to make much headway going forward. <laughs> Ask me a hard question. Norman. <laughs> <laughs> you can handle it. I mean, I, I, especially as you know, the um, parent of two young children, I um, deeply fear for, um, for that precise conundrum, right? So um, I think about the fact that they will grow up at a time and in a culture that is dominated by institutions that are unbelievably recent in their existence, right? So you think about the most powerful companies on the planet right now, the Facebooks and the Googles and the Amazons and the Alibabas. I mean, they're like 10 years old or a little more than 10 years old, right? These are, and these are, these are institutions that are arguably more powerful than the Catholic church right now. Mm. Um, you, even governments, you think about the two most powerful political entities right now in the world, in world affairs, it's the Chinese Communist Party and the US national government. They're both adolescents, right? They're, if that. So, wow. Um, so we're gonna be growing up in a culture that's kind of marinated in recency and, um, and kind of, um, it's like a false sense of importance and durability and so on and so on. Um, and so how within that, um, when those institutions, like all of their programming is designed to capture and exploit. Um, and so how are we going to educate young people to resist the messages of, you know, selfishness and, you know, kind of short-term material self-interest um, and instead nurture a kind of awareness of and curiosity about and regard for the needs of others. Um, oh, all, all I've done is rephrase your question. No, no, I think that that's really good. And I think, again, the story with your daughter is really powerful in this regard. Um, I wanna get to a question from the audience, which is how can we be realistic with our children and students about the crisis we face without filling them with dread and despair, right? You mentioned it's as though we, we are facing a kind of um, dissonance which overwhelms and shuts us down. What do, what do you yeah. do with students and your and, and children, do you think, to help them through that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's a wonderful question. And um, I, have, um, I have a bunch of thoughts on this. Uh, so with my students, I mean, I think that um, it's such an important thing in the face of these seemingly insurmountable, unfathomable existential threat. It's such an important thing to not only know and understand and engage with the mind, but also to act, right? To feel as if you're doing something that has some contribution to a better future. Um, but it's also important, I think, to not hinge your assessment of those acts on their demonstrated efficacy in the world. Because the, you know, the nature of the climate change problem is that the amount that any individual can demonstrably do to change the trajectory of, it's just, you can't do it, right? And, but here's, here's the saving grace in that, is that if we just show up with hope and act, if we show up with hope and act, there's always the kind of potential that our action will have an outsized influence. And by which I mean our social systems, just like our natural systems, are complex, adaptive, unpredictable, filled with non-linearities, tipping points, and so on. And so you imagine, you know, like Greta Thunberg shows up outside her parliament one Friday on a school strike. And then a year later, tens of millions of young people the world over mm. are striking in solidarity with her. Now, the haunting thing, but also the thing with promise is that if you had a model of the world, our social systems, and you ran that model 100 times, 99 times out of 100, Greta might be sitting there by herself a year later. But something happened, something magical happened, and it catalyzed a movement that has dramatically changed the conversation. Um, and so if you just show up with hope, you never know, right? <laughs> maybe yeah, I, maybe I really you're going to be... I mean, I resonate with that a lot. I get asked over and over again, how do you maintain hope in the context of so many depressing realities that we're looking at? And, 
And what I often say is the first thing we have to do is give up the presumption to know the future mm -hmm. because there's so little that we in fact do know. We know plenty that is terrifying, but as you say, we just don't know how the good efforts that we make right, will produce unseen, unknowable, unpredictable kinds of outcomes. And so, you know, the advice that I hear you giving is when you show up with hope, what you're actually showing up with is a disposition to exercise love and care, right? You want to show your care and demonstrate it in some way. And then you can only see what will happen. You can't predict what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So here's another question. Your story about Sonny and the newt highlights our obligation to creatures beyond ourselves and our kind. Can you say more about our moral legal obligations to other creatures, including non-humans and future generations? What do you think about the rights to nature constitutional approach as one example? Mm -hmm. um, so I love the question and I wanna thank whoever sent it uh, over the transom. I, I have a kind of ambivalent relationship to the rights of nature approach. I think if we hold constant our existing legal system and the moral philosophy and political philosophies that underpin that legal system, if we hold all that constant, then I think advancing a rights to nature approach um, or advancing, say, personhood and legal standing for non-human animals like primates and elephants and so on, I think those are very, very important initiatives. But my fear is that it kind of may distract us from pathologies that that remain within the classical liberal framework that we're trying to squeeze these non-human entities into. So the rights framework, it, it depends on a presumption that the right holder is a sort of self-possessed, individual, reliant, autonomous being that can go out and when they're wronged, they can assert their right against their wrongdoer, and the government exists to adjudicate those disputes. And, and other than that, the government is supposed to just leave us all alone so we can pursue our own individual definition of flourishing. Um, I'm being incredibly reductionist here, but that's kind of the, the mm -hmm. and of course, that's not what we are. We are interdependent, socially constituted beings. Um, and so to give us this kind of false sense of autonomy through rights talk and, and, and rights framing, I worry about that. And then when you try to extend it to the elephant in the zoo or the, the Lake Erie, you know, next to Toledo, like when you try to extend it to these other entities, then how are they going to hold up in the ensuing kind of battles, the liberal battles where their rights have to be pitted against someone else's rights? And I, I feel like I'd rather have a lot more focus, not on our rights, but on our obligations. Yeah, that's really good. I remember when Christopher Stone wrote the, the article years ago about whether trees should have legal standing, one of the retorts was to say, okay, now I have to look out for trees suing me, which just really <laughs> entrenches this atomized picture that we've got of folks. Um, there's a, a second part of that question that I wanna bring back, which is about, about our obligations to non-human animals. You've been working with this program with animals at Yale. What have you learned along the way about people's relationships and obligations to animals through that work? Well, um, the program is only, it's very recent. We've just been up and running about a year and a half. Um, and one thing I've learned is that uh, students are craving these conversations. They are craving a space to talk openly and frankly about ethical deficiencies of the current systems, um, the current food system, other systems. Um, and uh, just creating a space has been really encouraging and affirming for us because so many people have come. Uh, beyond that, you know, I, you know, I, again, I, I go back to this kind of critique of classical liberalism, which I think we're all so enmeshed in, whether we like it or not. But, you know, we have this sense that, you know, to ask the question, what do we owe other entities is to kind of ask, you know, in our relation to them, uh, are, are there circumstances of justice that apply there? Um, in other words, like, is the, are they an entity, a person, a rights holder that can make claims on us? Um, and you know, historically, 
so many writers in the classical liberal tradition, you know, would just categorize all, you know, enormous parts of life as being outside these circumstances of justice, because there wasn't thought to be kind of rough parity of power. And if there's not rough parity of power, then the assumption is domination just ensues. And there's not the reciprocity of respect that comes from being roughly equal in power. And, you know, women and children and people with disabilities and non-human animals have all historically been regarded as unequal in power and therefore only worthy of charity, not justice. And if you, you know, and, you know, thankfully we've widened that circle of concern and now we want to try to widen it further to include non-human animals, but I'm still frustrated by the starting point, which is that justice works that way. It works like a contract. Like I'll, I'll agree to offer you justice if I think you're worthy of it. That's a strange yeah. way to frame it. Right. No, that's really good. I know that in, in Hebrew prophetic and biblical traditions, the, the term for justice doesn't refer so much something like adjudicating disputes between people or entities. It's about coming into alignment with others, mm -hmm. which is why justice, mercy, and love are inseparable, not mm -hmm. separated out like you've just been describing. Mm -hmm. and, and this, I think, you know, helps us understand something about that, that there's a craving that we see in younger people, especially for not just just relations, but relations of belonging or, you know, to use Robin Kimmerer's language, you know, whom we both love, it's, it's a desire for kinship. Mm -hmm. Kinship with other people, certainly, but also kinship with non-human creatures and even with places. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's a path to go down to when we're thinking about the sort of imagination we're, we're trying to cultivate in young people and in our students? Because imagination is always a cultivated kind of thing. Yeah. Is that a path that you think would be better to go down? Well, I certainly, it resonates with me, and I would certainly love to have uh, more people in the world who feel that resonance. Um, and I, I, I love that it, the notion of kinship, um, it, you know, it suggests community, it suggests interdependence. Um, it also suggests, you know, something, you know, much more than just how can nature be valuable to me? Or how can this animal be valuable to me? It just gets beyond that kind of self-interested and instrumentalist way of evaluating relations and asks a very different kind of question, which I endorse. Yeah. So one more question from our, our participants. The pandemic has been characterized as a moment of truth and a chance for us to reset some of our behaviors and assumptions. What are some of the things that you hope we've learned in this time of pandemic? Mm. Well, I mean, I hope that I hope that we've learned that the systems and institutions that we are embedded in and dependent upon are deeply flawed, deeply flawed in that they are rife with inequality, deeply flawed in that they are utterly unsustainable. Um, so, you know, there's so many lessons to be drawn from this. Uh, the disparity in mortality from COVID cases along race and uh, poverty lines is just, it's such a telling, telling sign. And there's no way, again, you know, going back to that idea of dissonance, you know, so often the liberal mind wants to write away inequality as the result of choice, just desserts, you know, somehow make it the fault of the victim. And in this context, the disparity is just so awful that I just hope that is not cognitively available to anyone. Mm -hmm. And that we, as, a, as a going forward, we think tr deeply about how to make this a more equitable society. Um, but also on the, on the sustainability front, you know, just thinking about how fragile all of our, you know, system like supply chains in the food sector and how, um, you know, massive amounts of employment were dependent upon things like transport that are environmentally unsustainable. Um, you know, it, I hope it's an awakening that we can fashion ways of relating both to each other and to the more than human world that are, you know, softer, 
and more sustainable and, uh, you know, and, and, and buffered. Yep. And become gentle giants, maybe. And become gentle giants, yeah. So we need to draw this to a close. So thank you so much, Doug. I know that, uh, that you have presided presented uh, material that's going to be very helpful to us as we try to navigate this time and I also want to thank our webinar participants and just let you know that next week we will be joined by Kate Rigby from Bath Spa University so please take a look in the chat where you can see to register for that event so again thank you so much Doug thank you all and have a good afternoon <laughs>